All right, we are live. Uh, <laughs> teachers, idols, and masters, oh my. Um, this is a, a topic that I think has, has been in the air uh, for uh, a lot of our, our individual intellectual circles. I know it's been <clears throat> in the air for me personally uh, with a few different uh, events and situations forcing sort of deeper reflection on my part for uh, how I relate to these categories. Um, and before I sort of go in maybe to a little bit of a, a personal reflection on how I relate to this notion of teachers, idols, and masters, um, I want to preface it with just two quick uh, examples that caught my eye in my own personal studies from Nietzsche and Hegel, where uh, there's this scene in uh, the start of Thus Spoke Zarathustra where Nietzsche is talking about the last man. Um, and of course, the last man is this sort of, uh, you say, the opposite of the Oberman, um, or the opposite of the, the, the meaning of the earth and the overcoming of humanity. Um, and, you know, he makes this point that the last man will be uh, against ruling and obeying uh, because the last man will find this too burdensome uh, to rule and obey, to, to, to have a, a teacher and to, to be a student, um, to take an apprenticeship, to work under someone, and also to lead someone. Um, these types of dynamics. Um, and then, you know, fresh off of also in the middle of teaching the Hegel course and, and working through the chapter on self-consciousness, um, as is quite famous, actually. Um, one of the stages in that dialectic is the, um, the master slave or the Lord bondsman, where we basically have a battle of recognition. Uh, we have a battle of wanting to be recognized and recognizing. Um, and this sort of plays out in a drama of intersubjectivity which is pointing towards um, a necessity for what Hegel calls spiritual self-consciousness, which is defined as an independent subjectivity in social life. So a consciousness that has won its independence or won its capacity to be, um, let's say, within social life, but not um, reduced or regulated by the need to be recognized by certain idol or certain figure of authority or power or um, prestige. So these types of things, uh, the way I both think about the way Nietzsche and Hegel are relating to those concepts, is that there's something about an asymmetry in maturation and development which requires a certain a certain teacher student dynamic which is something that has to be cultivated on a conscious level and and moved through or gone through in order to become spiritually enlightened or the overman or whatever concept you want to point towards but that this is important dynamic. Um, let's see. And I think from that point of view, I want to reflect on how these notions and these dynamics have been integral for me and are still integral for me. On the first level, I have always idolized certain men, always. Uh, from as early as I can remember in my childhood up and through my formative development in young adulthood and still to this day. Um, idolizing, um, in some sense submitting to uh, figures who I perceived to be more talented than me or more knowledgeable than me or more 
or just virtue, like, you know, symbols of virtue and, and something to strive for, something to aim for. Um, of course, when these figures are at a distance or when these figures are dead, um, the transference power of the relationship is at a distance. It's they're, they're, they're not in my life. Um, but I would say that one of the strangest experience I ever had was, um, having that relationship between a teacher and a student be something that's extremely close, um, and something that's in my life. Um, and those dynamics are rare. And those dynamics seem to be inherently messy. Um, they're ethically almost, they're almost like an ethical nightmare when you're in them for both parties involved. Um, but at the same time, going through that process, in my case, there was something of a power in the fact that this teacher student relationship was simultaneously close and something that was politically economically bound meaning that i couldn't just escape or run away from it but had to move through it um where i feel like i have won something from going through that struggle in a way that i i would be i would i, I would even go so far as to saying i would be less of a man if i had not gone through that struggle um and then ultimately um you know, coming to this idea or this realization um, that, you know, even once you've moved through a struggle like that, um, you face two paradoxes in my experience, which is that struggle exists still within your own head. And the second paradox is, is that now you experience younger people putting you in that same role or position. And then how do you deal with it on the opposite side and that's a real head flip is you know seeing it from the other point of view and experiencing it from the other point of view so maybe these are some good starting points of reflection at least for me i, I just to reiterate there's the philosophical dimension that that i uh, sort of pointed towards where there's this way in which this teacher student relationship idolization masters and masters and, and and subordinates masters and slaves has some sort of catalytic power to it it points towards something of overcoming or a, or a spiritual beyond um and there's lots of examples of this that could be really interesting to talk about and then the personal dimension of i really do feel like that this this dynamic has structured my consciousness in a profound way, both in the abstract and also in the concrete as well. So I'll, I'll pass that, that on to, uh, to you, Javier. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I, I keep trying to think how I situate into this, right? Because I don't, I don't formally teach, but I do have, uh, I guess you could say some experience with uh, identity death, <laughs> you know, uh, being, being a poet. And at one point I, I believe my Instagram was shooting off. Um, but I really lost myself in that idea of pleasing the crowd. And it, it, I took real pleasure in being recognized by the crowd, um, to such a degree that eventually I got to the pinnacle point of, uh, I didn't, I, it actually felt extremely empty and I didn't know what to do with it. Um, so I, I kind of built this alter ego that was super sexual and it made everybody hate me. <laughs> it made everybody hate me and it stopped like the, the everything. And, but I had to deal with the, 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 the hateful comments, the, this, the you know, the, the dropping of followers, the no more liking, no more, uh, no more incentive to post anything. Um, and it, I mean, it was painful. I didn't realize how painful it was, how, how attached I was to that identity. Um, <clears throat> so I, you know, for me, even though ironically enough, I didn't really 
you know, I didn't have like a, a living uh, teacher per se, but the audience itself was like the uh, just as real and just as uh, the embodiment of, of a live teacher um, and being, uh, you know, sort of rejected by that. Um, and then ever since then, I just, you know, I, it, and it's kind of similar probably to, to Ebert over here, um, where when I started really paying attention to my art sincerely, when you do, when you do art in a real way, it teaches you how to die. It teaches you how to die. And that takes a lot of practice. And then once I started practicing doing that, my identity, it, I, it's now easy for me to take in a teacher, for example. It's very easy for me now to take a teacher, to, to take criticism, to not be recognized, because every time I do art, I do it to such a degree that I die with the last words of every poem. I write every poem with as if they were my last words for, for death. <laughs> you know, so that way I understand that I am fully emptying myself every single time uh, when I'm interacting with people that I admire or anything like that. So that's, uh, that's just, you know, where I'm kind of coming from. Uh, and then my army background where you are sort of forced to take a subordinate role anyways, whether you like it or not. And then you are forced to take a leadership role, whether you like it or not. Um, so this this causes pain too because it sucks when you have a leader that's garbage, um, and you have, and you still have to listen to them. Uh, and then finally, when you've been so morally destroyed from being a subordinate, and it's your turn 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 to be a leader, now it's the question is how. Since you weren't you were so used to being a subordinate, now you're a leader. What what do you do now? You got these little kids looking up to you. <laughs> they just graduated from college. They're like, they're like 18, you know. Um, and they're looking for advice about life and everything. The army is so different in that sense. Like it's these kids re really want like life mentoring. And you're just like, I, I'm just here to just do my time, you know. Um, so it, it there's there's that those experiences that I have. Um, and so I feel like you know, maybe, maybe that's what I can bring into the conversation, but, uh, I'll pass it to, uh, Jitan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I've been teaching for say last, um, decade or something, five, seven years, formerly in college universities. And you know, it's almost always um, when you enter a classroom every year, the, the, the struggle is to navigate between the permissive teacher and the strict teacher in many ways, you know, <laughs> and today's college dominant paradigm is such where, um, where, you know, the permissive teacher has uh, a greater leverage to um, impose himself on the students than the strict teacher in many ways, in, in some senses, and, you know, and, and, it, it cuts in immediately we should i think i think ask the question that why is why is this category of teacher actually so contentious especially in our times you know if you think about pre-modern times you already have a teacher which is ritualized in very fixed you know ways and we can think about that idea of the guru in some senses um, but if you think at the modern teacher there is something very displaced about that identity itself and something we need to think about, how do we understand that? And if we take, say, Hegel's question of, um, uh, you know, negation seriously, and we ask the question, and we create this formal structure, all learners are equal, you know, simple formal uh, structure. And the minute we translate into a substantial counterpart, we bring back the substantial counterpart where something like quantity would emerge you would immediately realize that that this formal structure would immediately translate into asymmetry between learners. That asymmetry between learners is necessarily a part of activating this formal structure. It's not something which is outside of it. So by very definition, this asymmetry becomes the necessary actualizing part of the teacher relation, teacher student relationship. You know, teacher in some senses becomes a minimal excess that very minimal excess that is required to navigate between two learners. 
in in some senses and and that that is you know that you know in in hegel's thinking that becomes the the concrete determinate part of the formal you know whenever the form has to be activated it has to be activated through the concrete determinate part of of of, of the structure and that determinate part then you know uh, brings in the new form and the dialectic goes on and we can we can think to that that problem but but at least within within this context we can see that that teacher becomes that minimal excess and um as as usually the problem goes with modernity we do not know what to do with excess <laughs> you know we we have we have no uh, way to uh, and um, and the easiest i think the response we have towards that excess at, in our times is um as elinka dupanchik sort of notes it is to exploit it you know there there is a non relationship and the and the easiest way to think about it is to let it be you know and if you look at your uh, modern education theories their only response to teacher student relationship actually is to let it be that's that's the that's the predominant response of our times that uh, we should somehow just let it be we should just uh, we should not uh, in some senses uh, be in any position to respond to this dynamic that's how your formal university discourse um um positions us in 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 that regard and that is where the the real challenge emerges that how do we recover some part of this dynamic in in what conditions in what ways can we recover this you know and that that i think becomes uh, um i think the key challenge in in our times and you know uh, we we you know we can we can go on on this and uh, but i think i'll i'll stop here and we can see you know where the discussion takes us cool yeah i love that idea of uh the minimal excess of competence essentially um creates the very the variations of uh, teacher student um and uh also Javier I like you know what you're saying about um about death um I think I have I have so much oddball experience with this hating teachers as a kid uh hating authority um finding a couple teachers that I really loved the teacher that always comes to mind when I think of my the best teacher I've ever had was not a teacher he was just a guy and the asymmetry was not contextual it was natural it wasn't a codified asymmetry um based on any kind of consent or explicit consent it was a natural asymmetry that i stumbled into where i met a guy who was just a guy at a bar who was smarter than me and i recognized that it was so overwhelming and so exciting that i gladly and eagerly submitted myself and was like let me follow you let me follow this fucking guy around i want to know everything about this guy and there was no formal arrangement there was um he never he was brutal very much like a guru in a sense but and he knew he was he knew he had the sort of cognitive edge on me he knew he had the analytical edge on me it was obvious in our interactions it was very plain and because it was so plain there was no need for me to i would challenge him but there was no need for me to like kill the father because it was just so obviously apparent that i was there to learn and that natural asymmetry when you find when you stumble into a natural asymmetry for me that's the only one i can trust in fact I've run into people that have analytical advantages or cognitive advantages but if it's within a codified context the advantage or the asymmetry is immediately suspect in my eyes and I don't necessarily respect the asymmetry and I do look to throw stones um and that's just me because I'm I'm you know somewhat um I'm just like very very rebellious uh to sort of preset contextual asymmetries. Uh I like discovering natural ones. And um and I think that that's, you know, as someone who finds themselves in a position 
uh, similar to my friend, John Salinger was his name. So, so, so now I'm older and he's died. He had MS and he, and he died recently. And, um, and I think about him a lot though, because I find myself in a similar situation that he found him himself in. And the, I think the thing that I, that I, I think the thing where the ego, the ego for me, my ego desires uh, some of that contextual asymmetries for it to be codified so that, um, so that it's just sort of understood. So there's a consent upon entering my sphere of influence, you submit, <laughs> just, you just submit and you know that you're supposed to, but I always, that always feels so uncomfortable when it's sort of like a prereq. Uh, understanding that someone's coming to me and like, hey, you're so smart. Like, what do you think about this or that? <laughs> but I will find that my ego will uh, will go ahead and uh, engage with that, you know. And I will engage with that on a certain level. And and yet, um, what that ends up doing is removing me so much from the subject that there is a sort of idle relationship there. And then that distance, they, that asymmetry, essentially is um, is is actively being imposed as opposed to naturally revealing itself. And um, that makes me sort of uncomfortable to be in that sort of idle position because then you can never really reveal yourself, your true self as a teacher. Suddenly I become self-aware and I'm aware of being existing as this idol for this person. Um, and that's definitely the experience of being on stage, being, you know, I wrote something down here just now that, um, Idolatry creates a crowdsourced assemblage of the subject um, displaced from the subject. So this projection of me onto me, which isn't me, it's an assemblage of all these other subjectivities projecting onto me, isn't me, but I see it. I see what they see through their eyes. I see the me they see. And so then I have a choice. I can either try and be and preserve that projection for them and for the sake of my ego and to keep that sort of space of idolatry or I can break it and Javier what you did was you you felt that pressure or, you know I'm, I'm speaking for you you can you know whatever but I've been in a similar situation where I feel that displacement that that essentially that simulacrum of myself and then you decide you have a choice do I you have three choices actually maybe one is, do I inhabit it fully? Do I Lady Gaga the shit out of this? The other is, do I break it? Do I kill it? And then the other is, can I live both with it? Can I oscillate and enter it and not and play with it and just be like, yeah, this is no big deal. Um, the, those are all very difficult. The breaking it is the one that I tend to gravitate towards because it feels at the very least more honest. Um, and... Uh, just wanted to say one last thing um, about maybe mastery, let's say. Uh, let's say mastery is a death of the process um, and that each peak is a plateau. Um, so that when we reach these peaks, they're actually small deaths, you know. And, and um, uh, for instance, that article that uh, Cadell sent you guys of Bad Guru New York Times thing, I haven't written anything since then. I wrote one thing in response to that, and I haven't written anything since. Now, I've been very busy with some other shit, but I found it very interesting. I've, I, I, that peak was a plateau, and now I'm waiting for the next sort of challenge. And, um, and so, you know, success is a sort of death. Um, and so mastery itself is a sort of death. Uh, anyway, I'll pass it on. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so, so much, so much, so much there. Um... I, I think the first thing I want to respond to is, um, you know, it, it's sort of using an example that Javier gave to contextualize what I think Chitan was saying about the modern teacher. Uh, when Javier said, um, you know, kids want life mentoring in the army, but I'm just here to do my job, man. Like, <laughs> like, like you're 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 looking for you know, like you're looking for some sort of uh, deep uh, teacher student relationship here, but you know I'm I'm just I'm just I'm just coming and checking in and I'm I'm going the other way and 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 I feel like probably a lot of like high school teachers or college professors 
uh, experience that uh, in the modern world where they're, and it's probably due to the bureaucratization maybe of, of uh, teacherly authority um, that like, you know, this is, this is just my nine to five. This isn't like a, a, a deep uh, sacred uh, drive uh, <laughs> that is, uh, you know, um, pointing to the overman or pointing to some uh, spiritual beyond in which we're uh, in some sort of developmental necessity here. And, and this, it, you know, which would, you know, which would reflect probably the more, you know, the, the, the stereotype of the pre-modern teacher where you have these deep sacred rituals, all teaching is embedded in some sort of, uh, you know, spiritual school or, or religious structure where there's, there is this deep necessity uh, at work. Um, and, and, you know, like the, the images coming to my mind are kind of like the, uh, you know, when you, when you, when you actively seek out a spiritual master and there's some sort of, um, you know, brutal training that goes on, you know, or, or some sort of, uh, really, uh, I don't know, uh, yeah, where, where you're, you're, you're basically having a sort of identity death facilitated for you by the teacher student relationship. And I think that is all absent in our bureaucratized, like modern student teacher dynamic. And, um, as Chitan said, there's more this proliferation of the permissive teacher as opposed to the strict teacher who's going to, you know, uh, give you some sort of disciplinary measure or disciplinary order. Um, and then like this question of, well, uh, where do we go from here? And, and, and where do we go from this dynamic? And I think, you know, on the one hand with what Ebert's saying, there's kind of like, well, and there's some, and there's interesting language, I think, in the way Ebert was framing his reflection on this, which is, um, I want the teacher-student relation or the master-slave relation uh, to be revealed, not imposed. You know, well, the the word "reveal" is kind of has a religious connotation to it, a revelation, like, like, oh my God, I, I just bumped into you at a at a bar, and and actually, like, I have a similar experience of that because. Uh, when I was in my doctorate, while I was in a type of battle with my my PhD supervisor, where there was a a feeling, a growing feeling on myself of a relationship of an imposition. Um, at the same time, I met someone at a bar in downtown Brussels, who wrote a brilliant blog, uh, and and I met him through some random connections. But I was just like. I just want to, I just want to pick your brain every weekend, you know, like, and, and so like, and so literally that's, that's what happened. I, every Sunday we would go and get, a, get lunch and have a coffee and we would just talk for four or five hours. My relationship with him was in some sense much more intimate um, than the, than any of my other relationships in the sense that, um, yeah, I was just using him as like a sounding board for all my new ideas. And I could trust that he would have, I could trust that he was going to um, bring the type of, um, I don't know, this remarkable thinking, which I respected immensely. Uh, and, and, and so I guess that is more in the line of this revelation of a teacher or some you know a willing submission to someone at the same time with this distinction between imposition and revelation you know i i come to the problems and the questions of well can that be the case for all of society can you know do, or you know are these contingent little spontaneous meetings something that actually can function for you know for for a social order in a meaningful way is, is that how we handle excess? Um, and then the other dimension of it is, well, in the relationship where I have this revelation over the imposition, the situation with the revelation, it doesn't have a any political economic dimension to it. Meaning I'm not in a structure, I'm not, I don't have any economic support. This is just a guy I'm meeting with every weekend to have a coffee. So, you know, there's benefits to that, but
But there was also enormous benefits to having the institutional support and having grant funding and having, you know, some sort of, you know, institutional structure where I can publish my work and stuff like this. So I don't know. Th these are just some of the ideas that I, I, I'm playing with here from, from, from what you guys have been saying. Um, but I want to also echo what Chitain was saying about emphasizing Alenka Zupancic's idea here that in modernity, precisely, we do not know what to really do with excess. And um, this excess is, in some sense, um, yes, we all know about the ways our um, attention is being exploited, for example. That's an example of excess. Um, but I think we probably underestimate the degree to which um, the next generation coming up is itself an excess which has no, let's say, teacherly authority in place, you know, and, and all, those all those structures are breaking down and, and, and what will become a society uh, as that excess becomes more and more unbounded. Let's say, and maybe it doesn't need to be bound. Maybe that there'll be totally new ways of doing this, and maybe the contingency of meeting will prevail. That's a possibility. It's just hard to think that. But any, we can, we can just anyone who wants to respond to that, we can just do more freestyle. I was just going to say that that. Um... This reminds me, the imposition versus revelation reminds me of sort of like incidentalism versus like the incidental versus the institutional. And, you know, I don't I don't live in Scandinavia or anything, but um, from what I gather, they've uh, shortened the school hours uh, dramatically and uh, and given, I think, very little homework. And they were, I believe, 26th in the world at, uh, you know, in their, I think, primary uh, I think it was high school, uh, educationally. And then they shot up to number one within like a matter of, I don't know, t a decade or something. Because the kids had less institutional time uh, and more time for incidentalism and potentially more time for revelation um, and more time to think instead of being told what to do. I I I'm, you know, I'm sort of, I'm okay with the the... the dissipation of uh, institutionalism as long as um for me i didn't start reading for instance until after i dropped out of college i didn't want to learn until after i dropped out of college i had to drop out and then i was like you know my my big thing when i got totally dejected i got very excited when i was shown um uh dharma bums i was like 14 and they're like here's jack kerouac I was like, oh my God, no punctuation. This is so cool. They're like, write a paper. And I wrote a paper with no punctuation. I got a D for no punctuation. I was like, fuck this, <laughs> you know? And then I, until I dropped out of college, I was finally like, okay, now I wanna learn. And um, I think there's something to that. I don't think everyone's like that, but I think, I think it's helpful to have the institutions, the teachers there. Um, and yeah, maybe permissive is not the right word for a teacher, for a good teacher, but um, but I do like the idea of someone who inspires you to give yourself permission to think, inspires you to give yourself permission to grow and, you know, et cetera. So, yeah. Do I... Right. Yeah, you're. Yeah, you're yeah. there. Yeah, I think there's something very interesting in uh, uh, Alexander. Is it okay if I call you Ebert? Is, is it? Yeah, yeah. So it's something very interesting in Ebert um, thinking about this question of natural submission. Actually, you know, and there, there's a lot of discussion, at least in India, where you have this contrast between what you have, uh, what you call the Guru Shishya Parampara in, in Indian Indian senses, for instance. Our classical music, a classical dance, still functions on those principles. You know, we actually have those uh, principles still alive. What we have something called gharanas over here, in, in in that sense. And then you have these formalistic structures 
And if we take Ebert's question of natural submission seriously, and I'll I'll put the nature word in quotation for now, but if we take it seriously, what we get actually is that there is some kind of formal recognition of the idea of teacher which actually hollows it from inside the sense that where this natural submission becomes impossible because you have actually formalized it you know it, it's its own natural um uh, outgrowth becomes uh you know it's, it's sort of like when jijak says that you know the very idea of making me famous is to make me redundant redundant the very idea of making teacher this formal bureaucratic structure is present in every classroom and so on and so forth is actually to make the idea of teacher redundant in some senses you know and that kind of an argument does exist let's be honest about it and if you go to any of these gharana then you ask uh, uh, you know teacher student relationship over there they are they are very suspicious of what happens in colleges and universities for them it's very alienating to even think that a teacher student relationship can be Structured around where two people can almost by choice decide to what degree they want to engage in it. You know, because teacher-student relationship by definition demands surrender for them, in some senses. Without that surrender, what you get is this this transactional relationship, which almost uh, uh, always enters into what say Walter Benjamin would call a contractual relationship. it enters into one form or the other con of contract and how do we think through that problem i'm, I'm not sure um, uh, we we actually have even the language to actually articulate that that question seriously and i think one way to actually articulate that that kind of a question uh, is to think about this relationship between autonomy and heteronomy so for instance uh, uh, in plato you know the very idea of autonomy as something i can think on my own self and heteronomy where my thought is dependent upon something else you know my memory is dependent upon something else and if you think about this relationship say in plato uh, much like uh, hegel's problem of being in nothing in plato you have these two things are separate from each other and plato is very suspicious of heteronomy in in that sense plato is thinking this artificial memories are a problem and by the time you get in derrida derrida actually argues and articulates that the these heteronomy and autonomy are actually composite in nature like being and nothing are they both are interdependent on each other they both are not separate from each other in in, in that sense and they both arise um, uh, in uh, the autonomy only arises in the conditions of heteronomy in that sense and if we take that kind of an argument seriously then i then one needs to take what uh, ebert is saying very seriously about this problem of natural submission you know because that kind of heteronomy becomes a condition for thinking for your own self absolutely i mean you know? that that's that was my experience with autonomy right i had all of this auton all of this sort of top down and you know the only way to even de de detect if one has autonomy is in if if it's in relation to a lack of autonomy and you know the only rules that are made are made for breaking and all of that um but yeah i mean i i look at most teachers uh like that as things to learn from and then okay like i'm going to now i'm going to kill you <laughs> now i'm going to break <laughs> this thing and and supersede you and if you give me shit for it then um then that's even better like like the more the more stress you present against my ability to sort of surpass you uh the better but um but yeah no i totally agree with that i think there it's a it's a dialectic yeah my my only problem and i'm i'm just no and, and, and what not problem is i just push you back on that 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 the problem that i have with so when i when i look at gharana then i've i've been into many of them because i've been in sports and dance all my you know young age in that sense work and i've been very bad at them but uh, one day or the other what 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 challenge actually emerges is that this idea of natural submission this idea of nature itself doesn't exist for for the modern man in the same manner uh, for some reason uh, that with that idea of nature itself is completely free and open uh for us uh, it it it's not it's not easy to actually find uh systems where through which this submission can be navigated for us so even you were very lucky that you were able to submit uh, naturally quote unquote in a in a surrounding which was which was which which was outside the context of these uh, the ritualized submissions that exist in these gharana and these places you know but uh the, the challenge actually is that that how do we rearticulate the teacher student relationship uh where at, 
we have some language for this submission outside its bureaucratic models uh, because there is no way to go back to the natural submission model in that sense. There is no way to go back to the three modern forms of teacher student relationship. And, you know, and, and sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, please. Well, well, specifically in regards to this language, I mean, um, the, 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 the term, for example, master and slave. Um, is just it's it's not something that sits well to the modern mind and 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 we I mean for various reasons which are uh, understandable but um, at the same time I think that um, perhaps what this what perhaps what the modern the modern uh, ideology of let's say very broadly um, individualism uh, individual rights you know, modern world struck by this push for individual rights and individual autonomy. Uh, what's what's missing in this ideology is a, a, an understanding of submission. And and I think that what has driven my development is precisely um, perhaps something that's been not you know implicit, not explicitly articulated is a willingness to submit. I mean, when I like, you know, in the context of, you know, I, I was saying this in a podcast recently, when I read Hegel or Freud, I am in a position when I'm reading there that I am massively submitted. So I am massively submissive. When I'm reading, I'm empty. And I'm trying to understand Hegel and Freud as they are and represent their thoughts as best as I can but I have to empty myself out. Now, that's doing that with Hegel and Freud, they're dead, that's one thing, that's abstract. That's an abstract submission. Now, concrete submission is a whole other issue. And it seems like in searching for a language for this concrete submission, um, what's at stake is is that we cannot bureaucratically formalize or institutionalize the ethics of this submission process it's not something that can be given in laws so again um here referencing phenomenology of spirit there's in the chapter on reason hegel reaches a point where he says the free spiritual consciousness tries to um give laws and then the free spiritual consciousness tries to test laws, but ultimately finds that it can't do either. And that it just has to be the form of the law itself and sort of seeing its own ethical self substance as the law. Now, in regards to that, what that means is, is that in order to move this dynamic of the teacher student outside of the institutions, it requires that there be knowers in the social sphere whom can be contingently encountered by younger people <laughs> like and, and 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 my my thought is is that it could be that what's happening in the online intellectual sphere right now is already providing that medium like because when i'm thinking about what's happening in my life um, there are younger people who contingently stumble upon my work or whatever, who will relate to me in a certain way. So, but that, now that that could happen also in, in the physical world. Um, and it actually has happened in the physical world, actually at the last conference I went to that happened. Um, but just trying to think that there might be something in universal spirit outside of any institutional structure which can naturally contain this excess That's my, <laughs> That's um so i kind of i kind of want to capitalize uh what ebert was saying about this excess because it actually made me think of lacan's cutting the time short between his patients he kept cutting the time shorter and shorter and shorter. But then also I was thinking about when you said, Cadell, this willingness this willingness to submit. Um, ironically, I was thinking about how would we test this? 
And I thought about the karate kid <laughs> where the guy made him do the most useless things. What he saw was the most wor worthless waste of his time. And he's like, I don't understand. Like I chose you as my master and you're making me do just the most, just you're wasting my time. And, and I feel like, I, and I never really understood, I didn't, never understood that kind of esoteric kind of teaching, but it became clear to me now. It's like, they're testing your willingness to submit. Are, are you going to kill whatever part of you is necessary to, to be my student? You know, because if, if you do think it's worthless and it's useless, then you'll walk away. You'll walk away right now, you know, but as the teacher also, he's not, so willing to accept everybody immediately. He's going to be like, okay, you say you want to be, you want to be my student, right? Okay. Let's see. Let's see how, how willing you want to be my student. Like the scene in fight club yeah, yeah. where they have them on the porch for like a few days. Of course, then we get into, then this is like, not a good example fight club where you have the, I mean, they're sitting on the porch there basically to join what becomes basically a, a type of death cult where they're going to blow up buildings. They're basically a terrorist organization. Um, yeah, but <laughs> so I guess this is why, I mean, when Chitan saying kind of like, um, you know, there's this... Um, modern, let's say, inability to think this excess. I think the reason why we're not willing to think it is because when you're playing with this excess, there is the possibility that you're, you're playing with fire. You're playing with things that could become death cults. You're playing with things that could become terrorist organizations. You're playing with things where people can get significantly abused and exploited. But then the paradox is, is if you just let the excess without any thinking about it, I mean, it kind of gets exploited in, in, in unconscious ways anyway. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the army is suffering from it right now because they don't know what to do with the suicide rates. It, it's, it's been granted that the, the army has the high, higher suicide rates than society itself. So they, they don't know what to do with it because we're told you got to be a soldier 24 seven. So you have all this access. <laughs> could we could we hypothesize that the increase in suicide in the modern world generally because uh, in every developed country there's a form of suicide that I don't think existed in the pre-modern world could it be because we don't think this excess and what to do with this excess we know that, you know, forms of, uh, even, you know, yeah, uh, we know that, you know, forms of capitalism actually do not know what to do with its own waste. If you think about even around yourself, waste is such a huge issue of capitalism because uh, it doesn't know how to bring the excess back within the, within the, you know, system in that sense to actually make it, make it a part of, uh, you know, in some in some some senses, its own growth and so on and so forth. Uh, capitalism is actually uh, about its it, it structures around its ability to keep the system, um, you know, within the same um, parameters in that sense. And to do that, actually, it constantly needs to collect the waste somewhere else. And that's that that's the problem of modernity in some senses. Uh, you know, it it always needs a separate site to collect it collect its own waste. And and that's something that can be seen in teacher student relationship also. Um, that that teacher student relationship actually has become uh, the 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 other site where the waste is collected. You know, in some senses, as a as a teacher, sometimes I feel that that my prime job is to deal with that waste. It's it's not actually teaching in 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 any real sense of the word. You know, I'm just dealing with something which which cannot be dealt with any other way in society. <laughs> you know, and, and I can, I can uh, vouch for that when I, you know, I don't only teach in college, I also engage with school children, I also engage and work with uh, children in slums and bastis, you know, and each space um, I encounter students uh, uh, where they're seeking something from me, where, which I do not have, you know, uh, 
uh, to g- give it to them in in, in that form of um, the equation. Nevertheless, I think I think uh, uh, what Javier was saying, and going back to I think Ebert's point, uh, we know in psychoanalysis there's, there, there's, there's an interesting point that comes in this, and it's come as to Karate Kid's question that um, in psychoanalysis, very idea that you intellectually understand something, or you have a language of psychoanalysis, for instance. For instance, you know. Uh, uh, the earlier joke of psychoanalysis was that you know uh, if you do not if you go to the analyst and you say that uh, um, the woman in I, I had a woman in my dreams I don't know who she was but it it was not my mother analyst knows it is your mother in modern times uh, the, the joke becomes reverse the person goes to the analyst and says the, I don't know who the woman was in my dreams but I'm sure it's my mother and and that that equally well becomes a problem <laughs> in, in that sense that when you intellectually understand something that itself can be the condition for your not able to learn it in some true sense of the word that itself can be a condition for your limitation in that sense and and that that problem actually was uh, dealt with in teacher teacher student relationships in particular because articulate is one kind of an example where uh, we assume that teacher student relationships is about breaking certain patterns of thought you know certain patterns of thought that you a certain language that you go with for instance when we read philosophy we know that if you actually enter into a say a relationship with somebody like gurjev or you know uh, something of that nature uh, one of the first thing that he'll do is he'll not teach you with philosophy not because philosophy is bad or something like that but because breaking that pattern of thought becomes extremely important you know because you you are trained in the pattern of thought somebody else who's who's trained in something else might learn with philosophy because again breaking that pattern of thought becomes the condition for learning in those systems uh that language we don't have uh, we don't even know how to encounter that kind of a uh, thinking because we can only teach with the patterns of thought the students are already familiar with as, a, as an analyst we i have you, you can have a lot of options as a teacher in in the modern world one needs to think about that 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 question in some senses <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean what you're talking about chitan isn't a language right i mean it's 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 a it's a non language but it, it's i i think the i like this concept and i want to shout out um Isik Bard Fidnar, who who writes a uh, Zizek analysis, because he he has this idea of a meta non language instead of a meta language. Uh, I think a false guru is trying to teach you a meta language, whereas I think a real guru, like you're giving the example of Gurdjieff, he's basically a meta non language. He's not shutting down language, but he's like this zero point within language. I mean, and that, that I mean, that's inherently something that can't be formalized or or, or institutionalized in any sense. Uh, the, the very, very conditions for this formalization actually breaks its own uh, productive function in some senses. That's the problem. It's yeah. not that, it, you know, it's not that it can't be formalized. You can always have a form for something, you know, as we know in Hegel. The problem is that that its own form cannot be resolved at the level of form itself. Yeah. That's the that's the challenge, and that's what he, and, and I think uh, even before Hegel Fichte actually understood this problem, that minute you actually have something at the level of form, and you try and resolve it only at that level without actually making it in some senses concrete, you enter into a problem. For instance, uh, uh, modern Dussel's paradox is one example of that. You can't resolve it at the level of form, which is why you enter into this question of types. <laughs> you know, if you think of you know set of all sets that are not member of themselves, and then you ask the question, uh, is it is that is is that set a member of itself or not? What you get is that you can't resolve that question at the level of form at all. You have to resolve that question at the level of substance, some determinate, concrete. You know, and Russell's answer was type theory. You can get into other kinds of set theories and stuff like that. And that is what I think uh, many spiritual teachers. I'm not saying Gurjev is an authentic teacher or not. I don't know in, enough about him. I'm just giving an example. But any authentic, uh, uh, is not only spiritual teachers, even dance teachers or sports, for instance. So when you learn sports, every good teacher knows that that you can't teach some uh, a, a young uh, budding sports person only through the form that the sports person already knows. He needs to do something that he doesn't do normally for him to grow further. You know, he needs to break his own patterns of movement and thought and so on, so for to learn new practices, uh, in, in some senses. And 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 not uh, this is not only something esoteric; it's something very very concrete uh, in in any practice-based um, you know forms of teaching. 
and something we 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 do not i think um, uh, you know we can't think uh, you know this, this relationship in form and content in this, in this manner you know especially in teacher student relationship i can give a very practical example that's coming to mind that i i discovered yesterday about this um teaching at the level of breaking form and that you can't just teach within a certain form but have to break the very form itself is that um uh, the 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 head coach of the duke basketball team is retiring and he's doing some sort of a retirement uh, uh podcast with former players and jj reddick who's one of his former players was talking about how when he was being coached by by coach k uh the way coach k taught him how to shoot three pointers was to teach him a form of three point shooting that had never been done before in a in a game before and he he had him learn this new 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 form of three point shooting which revolutionized his capacity and his confidence to shoot but it's the breaking of the form itself that 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 led to the new advance yeah yeah you you either you know mastered by the form or you're, you're a master of the form. I mean, the, the accounts of, you know, whatever artist, I mean, it's almost like a trope at this point. Uh, the, their early work, you know, is really like fucking alive. Then they go to school, they get a lot of training in art, their work becomes rigid. And then later in life, they break all that shit and then they really become masters. And that's when all their like best work comes out. And that's always the case. You have to be able to break the form. And the idea of like, how do you institutionalize that, you know, then that comes back to uh, death practice, right? Like the institution itself has to embed transition within it. And uh, the, the um, it has to become a sort of transitory institution where the institution itself can continually be sublimated by itself. And, um, you know, we live in a world, I think, where the preservation of institution and the preservation of self and the preservation of ego, I mean, everything is like, you know, uh, one big negentropic fucking uh, amalgam. Everything is trying to just avoid degradation. And that is the opposite of mastery. And it suppresses mastery. Now, at the end of the day, maybe it's a positive. Maybe that force of negentropic sort of suppression of, of, of transition is exactly the force required uh, to allow the um, to allow us to summon within ourselves the force to overcome it. Because at the end of the day, if I if I'm going to tell my daughter, nah, just try things different. No, try things different. No, 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 do it different. Just make it up. Just make it up. Don't follow the rules. If I'm going to tell her not to follow the rules. Well, she, the only rebellion she has left to her is to follow the rules, right? So it's in some sense the most helpful thing I could do or one of the most helpful things that all my teachers did was to try and create that rigor so that I could invest myself in trying to overcome it and break it. Um, so, yeah. I think that's a really important point is that, is that if, you don't, if you don't learn a certain discipline – and cultivate a certain understanding. Like you have to learn how to write and you have to learn how to read before, or you have to learn how to paint. Like, I mean, maybe Picasso is a good example that's coming to my mind as someone who, I mean, he knew how to paint formal classical paintings and he knew how to paint all what the previous artists could paint before he then broke the mold and, 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 and basically started painting things that, at first glance, you would say a child is painting them. But there's something in the fact that it's not a child painting that. It's, it's someone who's been through a rigorous, disciplined process. And I think actually the same idea is coming to mind for someone like um, uh, James Joyce's uh, Ulysses. Is like with that writing style, and maybe Ebert, you're pointing towards this with writing without punctuation, but you know. James Joyce knew how to write probably just as good as any of the uh, previous classical writers. 
but he broke the mold of writing with with a book like with a book like Ulysses, uh, where it had like long run on sentences, punctuation here and there, the the, the thought is everywhere kind of thing. Um, it's like basically a stream of consciousness book, um, but that doesn't mean that you should just jump into stream of consciousness writing, or you should just you know. I think you have to go. I think what we're saying is is that there is a disciplinary process that you have to go through. And I think that's where the subject needs to submit to a master. And then once you've gone through that process of submitting to a master, then you can break free of the form and you can play with the form perhaps more. I mean, on, on your own internal logic, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, just to add to what Ebert and Ebert had a, I think, a brilliant, many insights in what he said. Now I'll just you know, pick the last one and and take Cadell's uh, note here. So we need to we need to understand that actually uh, this question of breaking away from form in some senses and and breaking away sublation uh, uh, substantial. We can use different words for it uh, at this point of time. Uh, but what it actually entails is not simple change. In fact, we have to be very honest to ourselves that that uh, that simple changes are necessary to hold the form together. If you change something too much every day, you are actually not changing the form. In fact, that is how form sustains itself. For it's, it's the same thing like when you want to go for shopping. Uh, the very uh, the idea of holding yourself to shop every day is involves you to buy new clothes every day. If you buy the same clothes every day, the idea of the, going through that that desire will break down. The desire is sustained because you can buy new clothes every day. That is how essentially capitalism sustains itself. Those small incremental changes, those that that idea of a newness in that sense is held together um, uh, through uh, the, 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 the structure of the form in which these changes are taking place, which is why radical newness, which is why actual break, actual sublimation or you know um, sublation actually occurs when there is radical repetition. When you allow the repetition to take place, when you actually allow yourself to follow the rule, when you actually allow yourself to follow the rule, it is then you break away from the form. And that is the contradictory thing that you have to think about in this question of surrender, which I think Kedil is pointing out. That till the point we are not allowing ourselves to follow the rule, that repetition to take place, we do not find a way out of this, this, this problem of the form itself. Um, you know, and and one can see that that that, that problem emerges you know, between any radical repetition and radical newness. Uh, let me let me jump off that very quickly uh, on because I like your example here of this. Um, I would be I would be interested to know how this would apply to the person who's literally shopping every day. Um, but in in my example, so I, I want to give an interesting example because I often um, encounter people who want to overcome Hegel before they ever really understand Hegel. Like they, they want to jump over Hegel without before they, I, I, whenever I see people do that, I, I'm just like, oh, it's like ridiculous. But the, 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 my attempt is, is that I'm repeating Hegel. Like I, every time I, every time I read the phenomenology of spirit, I, I'm repeating it in a, with a slight difference. And my intuition is, is if I keep doing this, that's actually how you break away from Hegel. <laughs> Eventually, I will get beyond Hegel, but I have to repeat him thoroughly. Yep, you have to repeat him exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but that make that makes sense because you need the student to become almost to the point he's discontent to keep doing like keep uh, keep doing this repetition. That eventually he's like this. I mean, actually, the I think was it the Auguste Rodin and, and Reiner Maria Rilke are a perfect study for this because um, Rilke Rodin taught Rilke how to do a new way of writing poetry, which was by staring at an object so intensely that you empathize with the object, right? But Rilke wrote a whole new set of poems for that, and then finally he broke away from that and came out with some of his best work that he's ever done, the Duino Elegies, Sonnets to Orpheus. I mean, so. There is something, there is something about like repetition to the point of completion, but it's, it, the completion isn't clear. It isn't clear what that completion is. 
or when when that will be for the student that that kind of completion. Um, and I guess that's what's hard to pin down about this repetition. It's not very clear. You can't mark it down and say like, okay, now you're going to cut it off and kill it. Um, he has to. Uh, it's almost like you have to guide. You have to raise him to kill it. That's the whole point, right? The, the point is not to tell him to kill it, but to raise him to kill it. And I feel like that is a whole different way of um, of teaching to, to raise somebody how to kill something instead of telling them how, like just telling them to kill it. Because they don't know how to kill it. If you tell them to kill it, they don't know how to kill it. So you got to raise them how to kill it. Yeah, I want, I want to jump in about completion. Um, I think I think something is complete when it becomes nothing. Um, and this comes back to my, my infamous uh, every totality is the only nothings are made from totalities, are made from completions. Um, when something is complete, it becomes, it disappears. Um, and I think that, you know, we can give really practical examples. You... You know, you watch Steph Curry do his fucking drills, right? And he's just nailing them. He's not, it's body, it's muscle memory. He's not thinking. It's pure muscle memory at this point. It's become nothing. It's just about the repetition, the repetition, the repetition, the repetition. And suddenly the practice becomes nothing. There's no conflict. There's no contradiction. There's no, there's nothing going on. There's no learning anymore. It's become a nothing except what he has to do is continue to repeat it so that it remains like nothing, so that it remains uh, complete. Um, and yeah, I think, um, you know, and, you know, bring in Buckminster Fuller, but like, like the, just the idea of that completion making the previous state obsolete. And um, it just, I, I just love the idea, uh, Chetan, that you brought up, that just that repetition is the, you know, there's a very big difference between responding or conflicting with something and then transcending it or sublating it, right? If you're, if we're responding and I'm saying, no, I'm not this, I'm different than this, then that other thing is still the counterpoint against which you're defining yourself. You have not transcended that thing. The only way to transcend the thing is that it's no longer a counterpoint. It has essentially disappeared. And through repetition, and if we just look at sort of like, you know, it's like my freak theory shit, but like, when we repeat, 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 like, like, like you mentioned, um, Lacan going just client, 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 then the clients just sort of disappear, right? The whole thing, the whole practice disappears because it's become everything and every totality disappears everything. So we repeat, 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 repeat. All of a sudden it's a flat line. So if you have these waveforms, sorry, I'm getting into freak theory for a second, but if you have these waveforms you repeat, repeat, you repeat enough, you zoom out, it's a flat line. And I just love, I always love that imagery. And I think it just uh, dovetails nicely with what we're talking about here. Yeah, I can, I can go off this, the examples you're giving, maybe specifically uh, <laughs> combining uh, Steph Curry and Buckminster Fuller, which has maybe never been done before. <laughs> so, so that's, so, <laughs> but, it, but it, it's, it's good. It's those like, if completion makes the previous stage obsolete, I think Steph Curry is a good example because like Steph Curry is someone who is not Michael Jordan. Like Michael Jordan was like the, the, like the perfect form of basketball. And then you'd have people like Kobe Bryant who basically tried to mimic Michael Jordan, but they can never, they're always responding to Michael Jordan. So Michael Jordan's still the form. Whereas Steph Curry is not responding to Michael Jordan. He's a, he's a new form. You know, he's not, so it, it's kind of like it makes the previous, it makes the previous form obsolete and then sets a new paradigm for, for what the form is, if that makes sense. What's interesting about Steph is that he couldn't be the form because of physical limitations, right? So he couldn't. Well, he came up with a whole new style. He couldn't even do it. Yeah. So it wasn't even an option. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I think that that I think that that applies to philosophy. I think that that applies to different forms of art. I think that, like, what we're stumbling upon. But at the same time, I mean, how can we tie this back into um, teachers, idols, and masters? Is is that that new form 
becomes the new idol. It becomes the new teacher. It becomes the new master. Um, it's what the next generation is going to be looking up to. Um, and then that then becomes the form which needs to be learned and repeated until that form is transcended. And it goes on like this, perhaps. And that's like maybe the immortal repetition in the death drive. Absolutely. If you if you look at the Kuhn's uh, theory of paradigmatic shifts and scientific revolutions in that sense, that is how exactly it, it, it you know he's, he's thinking about it in that sense that each scientific paradigm brings with its own rules, and you know scientists keep on repeating them, exhaust those rules out at some point, and then suddenly a break happens and something completely new emerges and a new paradigm emerges and a new set of you know rules emerge if you if if, if you think about it, uh, you know. Uh, I, I, I want to shift the topic a little. I want to go back to Ebert's question of uh, importance of death in, um, um, you know, uh, in the teacher-student relationship. Uh, you know, I remember I, I, was, I, was, I was trying to find uh, Wittgenstein's uh, you know, very interesting quote where he said that uh, only point um, a student has actually learned is when he can start using the rules on his own. You know, and, and, and there is certainly a point when a student can use the rules on his own. And after that, it, it, you know, that relationship can have some some formal significance in your life, but you move on. I don't know. You know, at least the relationships I've been in, I know that, that you know, I, I have had to move on at some stage. At some stage, you you you, you know that you learn at, at, at some level and you, you know, try and think of those things um, on your own. Um, but actually, this moving on is, is a confrontation with death over here, which, which I think is important to think about. All teacher-student relationships actually has this death presupposed into it, built into it in some senses. Now you can read the, you know, the, your your uh, past materials on this, or you can you can find uh, current, uh, you know, uh, each, so for example, each gharana that, that that I've been talking about, each sports relationship, if you think about it, it's not that that the the coach you start with, you the coach you end with. Each time you have to. Uh, move on in some senses, in, in, in that sense. Uh, uh, and how do we think about this death? And how do we actually completely affirm this death in the teacher-student relationship? I think that that, that remains something we, we need to uh, ponder upon in, 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 in some senses, in, in, in such a discussion. Because uh, uh, to simply overlook this death also can make the teacher-student relationship um, become hollow from inside in some senses. Uh, it, it, can, it, can, it can allow it, it itself to be extending beyond its, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, beyond uh, its time. Beyond, beyond its time, yeah. yeah. And then how do we, how do we, how do we think through? I it? want yeah. to talk about this because this is a very, this is a very uh, emotionally charged uh, issue for me, and, and actually ethically problematic. I would be interested to know how, if any of you have had that experience. I know for me, with the example I gave of the teacher who was kind of like a revelation I we and we met for coffee every Sunday or whatever during my doctoral student at a certain point when I think he felt okay this relationship has had its time he simply disappeared and so so I, I don't I and I wonder if 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 I need to do certain things like that do I need to do you need to become a, a disappearing act The vanishing mediator, right? The vanishing mediator, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that that's helpful because the disappearing is the death. You, you know, we have to be willing as teachers to be overcome, to to die. As parents, we seem to, I seem to intrinsically desire that, but I know that there are parent, uh, uh. uh Jesus Christ. Anyway, uh, parent, uh, kid, children, that's the word I'm looking for, parent, children, relationships um, that um, where the parent is not really that willing to be overcome. Um, and um, and I think that fucks people up, you know, and, and yes, to be a strong barrier that they have to exert force against to, to overcome is one thing, but then being completely unwilling and driven and overdetermined by your unconscious uh, death drive uh, to, re to totally resist their overcoming and, uh, and not be a vanishing mediator. Um, 
essentially ends up just creating neuroses in the student. Um, so, yeah, I think I think this 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 willingness to die, especially on behalf of the teacher, um, is crucial. And whatever form that takes, vanishing. I mean, it'd be kind of amazing to be in university and going to class, going to class, and then one day you show up, the teacher's just not there. <laughs> It's like, apparently class is over. Apparently we graduated, you know, like that there should be some temporal flux that, that where, where class reacts to the actual progress of the students, as opposed to this sort of, you know, uh, rigid um, uh, uh, calendar, um, you know, but you know, I, I don't know. I think for me, I'm just like so, so anti-institutional that that's what I would need, but um but I do think that, you know, I mean, tenure is a great example of like total refusal to die as a teacher, right? Like I want to get this status where no matter how I teach, I can't be fired. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just want to say in the movie, um, in the movie Goodwill Hunting, there's a teacher student relationship between I, their actual name, their actors names are Matt Damon and Robin Williams. Everyone knows that movie, I think is that actually at the end of that movie, they both function as vanishing mediators for each other. Because not only does Matt Damon sort of totally change his direction and vanish from the city he grew up in, but Robin Williams' character vanishes from his role as a psychotherapist. And he, he you know, he, he sort of, it served his, it served his, his, his function. And, and then, and both were mediated by the way, by the sexual other, the, the sexual non-relationship. That's what was at work in their, in their, in their teacher-student mutual vanishing. <laughs> Is it possible, Cadell, to have a vanishing where it evolves into a friendship? It's no longer master-student, but it becomes into a friendship. Um, but I feel like, I know what I'm saying, it has a lot of specific prerequisites for that i think there I, here's here let me just say what my hypothesis would be and then respond to this my hypothesis would be there needs to be a, a legitimate death a vanishing a gap and then a spontaneous contingent refinding because then it would be a genuinely new relationship that would be my hypothesis because otherwise there's otherwise there's still that excess of the transference which is not which it, it's still there yeah i, I think uh because what is it with, with the reading of rodan and uh, rilke that i've been doing what i've noticed is that your first disagreement can be like your first breaking of with the teacher um, and this is what I've noticed with the Rilke and Rodan is that this is when they actually became friends because he started realizing that Rilke became so like passionately like, wow, this is me stepping into adulthood because this is my first real disagreement with the man that I've loved for so long. And we're still having conversations and we're still talking. Of course, what ends up eventually happening is that uh, Rilke sees Rodan grow old and rigid and he just starts decaying and he realizes that Rodan never actually had a real death like he never actually went through a real death a real artistic death he ends up realizing that the growing old becomes the real fear of death that is taking over Rodan um, which is interesting and that really turns off Rilke in the end um, that's important yes that and so I think there's also this aspect of aging, too, that, uh, you know, it kind of needs to be thrown in because it's funny because I feel like aging is like the natural cutting off with the student and the master because the student will see through the age that as the master ages. I'm thinking of Star Wars instantly, you know, Luke Skywalker <laughs> aging and he's like, I don't want to teach anybody, man. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> um but that they become bitter and they, and they change and it completely fractures the, the student's fantasy about their master. I think that's why the master should become a vanishing mediator. He shouldn't let that happen. He shouldn't let that happen. I, I don't think so. I think the, I think the master should vanish before that happens. Hmm. 
uh, uh, if I if I, I I I may want to push back a little on on the structure actually. I, I'm not saying I think managing is a perfectly all right thing to do. I'm not against it in that sense. But I, what 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 I what I mean to say here is that that uh, more often than not, if we change the student, if if we accept the debt between teacher and student relationship. Um, it can function after in myriad of ways. It's not necessary that vanishing is the only way through which that can be done. For instance, it can exist as a as a formal symbolism of something that you had in the past. You may still say he's my teacher, but you know that you've moved on. That that knowledge still accepts exists over there. And I've seen that happen in more than one case where you know um, there, there's acceptance of of the moving on bit, and yet whenever you go back and meet your, you know. Master, you'll respect him and you'll give him that respect and and you'll and you'll move on. Uh, there is the vanishing act, of course, which which does that radically. Uh, in my cases, most many times when students get attached beyond uh, their welcome, uh, I play the <laughs> you know I I I usually play that uh, you know um, unresponsive and cold and distant um, <laughs> person you know who's no longer interested. And I and and maybe sometimes when a person, same person, comes back to me a year year later, I'm very interested. I'm interested in know where he is or where she is, and I'm very curious. And you know, once, once, that, yeah, once that once that gap is established, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once that distance distance is established, and then we both yeah. accept that there's a distance there now. My you question know, to you is: it is it difficult for you to play unresponsive, cold, distant? Is that difficult for all. you? Not no. at all. Not at all. Not at I all. enjoy it. I, I, I'm I'm more than happy playing that playing the devil over there in that sense because I know <laughs> because what, generally what happens and this is this is the I think the Foucauldian point over here in some senses and I see that happen many times that once when you overstay your welcome in any of these help when you're a student or the teacher whichever way uh, you actually en enter into a zone of silent death. You let somebody die rather than accepting your death. You know, you allow certain populations to die. Similarly, you allow certain relationships to die also. It can be a love relationship many times. When things are dying and you're letting it die, rather than taking responsibility for it. And you know that each time when you try and intervene, you try and make it better, the death becomes more and more clearer to you. And sometimes you have to really accept it that, okay, it, this is it. You know, you, the very act of saving it is, is actually making it, making, it, making it a zombie in some sense. You know, you're keeping it alive after its death. And you can keep things alive after the death for some reasons at certain points in life. But you need to be very conscious that something is right. <laughs> you need to be aware. It can be a love relationship. It can be a relationship with your parents. It can be a relationship with your, you know, uh, lovers or teachers or whatever in, in that sense. Uh, I think, I think, I think that, that, that death plays an important role. And if you don't accept its reality, uh, you can enter into zones of violence which are, uh, which, which are in some senses, quote unquote, zombie-like, which are, you know, uh, where, where things are almost acting on its own without you know you being able to participate in them in a conscious way yeah. just to add but this is not always the case a lot of times uh, um, that gap is very very easily achieved sometimes it's, it's much more difficult but a lot of times it's very easily achieved also. Isn't it really common in university or graduate school for the, the students and teachers to collab to just sort of like just modulate into equanimity and collab on a paper or a book or whatever or no? Yeah, I have, I have many students who collaborate with me over the years, uh, yeah. much after they've they've passed out. But but that that, that this this thing was very easy with them. It's not about year to year. Some students get close to you also. Some students wants to learn from you outside their classrooms in that sense. Students that I teach only in classrooms, it's easy to distance, of course. But there are students where different transference relationships developed in that sense, yeah. where they are, where, where where they want certain kind of personal attention, where they're coming to your reading groups, where they are meeting you outside college. You know, and then uh, then uh, uh, other things sort of uh, you know enter into those those equations. So I think it becomes clear that as a master, you have to know you have to have the wisdom to know what your student needs, not what he wants. Um, because <laughs> you know, obviously, I can't, I can't, we can't give everybody the same 
uh, sort of vanishing act, right? We can't give him the same vanishing act. We have to be, we have to be like, okay, if he's pressing on it, then we need to do a radical one, right? If he's radically pressing on me, I need to do radical vanishing probably. Um, but if it's a sort of more natural, just student teacher relationship, then I think it, you know, it will naturally fade as it, as it goes on. Right. You know, though, um, but I don't know. I mean, what do you guys think about that? What I'd like to ask, ask is like, this is all very romantic. And I wonder why it needs to be so fucking romantic. Why not just tell the student, Hey, what, Hey, guess what? You're dead to me now. Why, why act cold and distant and aloof and kind of not respond and then respond when they come back and like, oh, yeah, it's on now. Why, <laughs> why, why not just make all this explicit? What is the inherent romance that we're talking about? Because all of this is like, oh, yeah, and then the dance and then we vanish and then how to know. And it's just like, why not just talk about it? And would that well, ruin something? Would that ruin part of the process? That's a really good question, Ebert. Why, why don't you just talk about it? Uh, in my experience, uh, uh, more often than not, talking about it doesn't help, actually. I agree. Because there is real transference over there. You know, that's uh, the thing is that we're dealing with transference. That's important yeah. to... Yeah, that's important to realize. You need to act on it uh, in different ways rather than simply... Uh, if you could talk about it, you wouldn't need to actually do those things. If I can actually talk about it to somebody, I wouldn't need to do any of this stuff. I'll simply say it, you yeah. know. And then, and more often than that, I, I, if there's, there's a room for that conversation, I don't even need to do it. More often than that, that 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 understanding comes very naturally and very easily uh, if there's a room for that conversation. And if, if we're yeah. just having if we're just having a conversation about it, then we're assuming that what we're dealing with is a rational, conscious cogito. We're not dealing with a rational conscious cogito. We're dealing with unconscious attachment needs. And the vanishing to me, how I make sense of it is it basically mirrors the function of the analyst in an analytic session because an analyst in an analytic session is a vanishing mediator. It's he's not even supposed to be there really. He's just there to mirror. And in my experience, like, so in my, per, my, in my experience, when for ex I don't know how personal to get here, that's the thing. I don't think I should get, I think I should watch myself on how personal I get here. But in my experience with this, it's that there are situations where people just come back and they come back and they come back and they hyper fixate. And there, 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 is, no, there is nothing rational to be done about the situation other than I'm, I don't exist. <laughs> I don't exist anymore. Sure, but don't you think there's something, I mean, aside from the codified institutional setting, um, for instance, if my friend was to recognize and explicitly say, hey, it seems like I'm kind of your teacher, right? I would have hated that. I preferred it to be unspoken. It was sort of more sexy and more like, oh, yeah, we're doing a dance. If he was like, if he was to explicitly say, Hey, so uh, so you're coming here to learn again? I'd be like, fuck, fuck you, right? <laughs> so what is it about this? What is it about the unspoken aspect of this dance that uh, that almost sort of needs to remain unspoken? It's I'm, I'm finding it sort of fascinating. So it's it's the met in my language. Let's connect. I want to connect this to what we were talking about previously with the the difference between the false guru being a meta language and the real guru being a type of meta non language. It's not, it's like the void within language itself. And the, I mean, I think if, if you're talking about like, for example, this revelation where you meet a teacher and you submit to that person, it's kind of like, it's not any of their specific knowledge that you're interested in. It's that you're interested in them as a knower. You're interested in them. And so it, it, it's kind of like, that person himself uh, needs to disappear when he sees like, okay, my, what I can offer this student, what I can offer this person who has willingly submitted to me is it's everything I can offer is, has been offered. I don't have anything else to offer this person. 
I mean, not so, yeah, please go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kudil. I will change the topic. Yeah, please go ahead. I just want to say it might even mirror the ethics of breaking up in romantic relationships. That in romantic relationships, sometimes, <laughs> or even as a rule, rationally discussing the breakup is not really possible. <laughs> you're, you're just going to be spinning in circles because you're like, that's my, if, if you rationally discuss the breakup, it's like, you're just going to spin around forever. There needs to be the break and the gap. That's all I have to say. Yeah. I, I'll sort of quickly respond to I think Ebert's one point, and I'm not sure if I'm it's relevant what I'm saying because, uh, but I think Ebert's question at least in part needs to be separated from a certain times naming something is actually violent. Naming something is almost always violent in some senses, but uh, sometimes naming something actually uh, cordons it off from its other uh, identities. In the, in in that sense, so sometimes when when you talk about say when you go to a teacher and when he says oh, you are my student in that sense, and he names that relationship, uh, that relationship takes a different form for you than you you were having a fantasy of or imagination of when you were going there. And there is violence involved in that. And I'm not sure uh, we can discuss the ethics of that violence, definitely. I think we can uh, say lang language is violence, right? Language language is violent, but, but, but that language, that, that violence essentially has some basic roots in naming itself. When you name something, you actually um, put it, up, uh, uh, you actually coordinate off from its other yeah. things. So yeah. if you name me something, I, I'm many things, but I am named one of them. And I'm, I'm, I'm stretched apart from the other things that I am, you know, that is yeah. how identity functions yeah. in, in some senses. And, and that, that tension actually a lot of times remains in many relationships and where, where naming it can become, um, you know, so a lot of times, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of times when, when, I have friendships with people, and I, inevitably, sometimes I am the student or the teacher in the relationship, and that happens. Uh, it's not necessity that I will name it. In fact, more often than not, I would not want to name it uh, for very practical reasons, not for any emotional reasons, uh, but for very practical reasons, because I know if I name those relationships, uh, uh, other things which are not there right now in that equation would get involved. A lot of time, the teaching learning process is much more smoother without naming it. Without okay. actually, actually giving it, the there, there's just one example I'll give from my own life, and I, I agree with what you're saying, and I love the idea just that language is violence because you know, and it, and it does cordon off anything from its uh, extended potential. Um, but um, so in my band, I, I I was the leader of the band. I started the band. I'm still almost embarrassed to say I was the leader, right? So that's part of the story. And um, and it was a very sort of egalitarian thing, and we're a traveling troubadour. But meanwhile, I'm doing I'm doing probably 90% of the work. I'm sitting there, I'm writing the songs, I'm slaving over the songs, I'm doing it. And, and, and then the, we get together and record, record them. And that was the way the first and second album went largely. And, um, and third album. And I remember, but we had this egalitarian, we're all, we're all in this band together and this thing together. And it's like, you know, and I remember I'm at this festival and I hear one of my band members won't say who, a kid on the uh, at the festival is like, and he had just joined. This guy goes, "Hey, so how do you guys write the songs? Does does he write them, or do you guys all write them?" And he, and I, he doesn't see me, and he goes, "We all write them together." And I was like, "Oh, fuck, that's not true." First of all, <laughs> and secondly, the the not talking, the non naming, had manifested into a reality of naming that was not in concert with reality. And, um, and that fucked me up. And suddenly I started being like, okay, wait a minute. Um, and I started, I started tracing my, my silence back and I started naming things um, because r uh, the, the fantasy had spun, the fantasy of, of non-naming and the relation. And if I was to be like, yeah, I'm the leader of the band. Everyone would be like, whoa. But then at some point it became necessary to be like, hey, you know what? I'm kind of the leader of the band. And my <laughs> vote, my vote is gonna count more. 
than anyone else's because of X, Y, and Z and da, 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 da. And so, and that was really helpful and clarifying and hard and weird, um, but like, but also necessary. So anyway, yeah, it's just, that was uh, that was the experience that I'm sort of like questioning this from. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think this. Sorry, go ahead, Chitin. Go ahead, go ahead, Kenneth. Go ahead. I just want to say I think. Well, I think that's such a good example. Um, but I think that is why, and I've had that experience myself in my own way. But I think that is all of the mess about teachers and authority and and masters is that we want to have this fantasy of egalitarian relationships and it's traumatic to say i'm the leader actually it's traumatic to say actually i did the most work or it's traumatic to say actually we're not all equal here or we're not all the same skill level or we're not all the same work ethic it's traumatic to name this <laughs> but i think it but i think that's what all the mess is about and i think that 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 we we I think going through that process is a precondition for mature social organization and also to avoid sort of secretive, sneaky totalitarianism. That's all I have. But, but you know, Cadell, where does that begin? Where does the first naming begin? It begins at the family, doesn't it? When they say, you're my son. <laughs> and all that excess gets now carried on because it's been called out. It's been called out. And now I have to deal with that subordination that I hated so much because I got called out by saying, well, you're my son. You're in my house. <laughs> you know, and it's like, it's kind of like we all knew it. I, all, I knew I was her son. I knew it was her house, but it wasn't until she said it. Right. And I feel like this is why now it kind of has to be unsaid uh when it goes it's into the yeah flip yep it, and this is what chitan was talking about about the strict teacher and the permissive teacher but this reflects also the family we've we flipped from the strict family where i'm your father and this is my house and i put dinner on the table and and where do you think you came from <laughs> <laughs> to the to the permissive father and mother where no 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 we're it's like an egalitarian collective and uh, you can do whatever you want and i and think there are negative sides to both of these extremes uh, i think to to take your point kettle uh, i think gabriel to be number i think said it somewhere you know uh, that Marxism doesn't have a theory for the anxiety that comes with equality. You know, uh, normally meetings with, in which everybody is equal are much more anxious anxious uh, than meetings where everybody is. <laughs> you know, you know who, who the authority is in some senses. <laughs> you know, who, who the leader is. And, and, and to take that, that, that point with Ebert further and what Ebert is saying, and I think it's very important, uh, just because naming is violent doesn't mean it's not necessary. Uh, let's not let's not kid ourselves in that sense. Naming is a very sacred act in many ways. Uh, you know, it it helps us. Uh, there are certain moments when it can be violent, and there are certain moments when you don't want things to be named. But uh, more often than not, naming gives you a clear uh, understanding of how authority functions because naming actually demands authority, and we can get into that discussion of authorship in that sense. And I remember uh, Hannah Arendt having a very interesting perspective on it, uh, which is something of this nature. I'll quickly put it, which is that the problem with authority is that when you hollow all authority out, what you get is bureaucratic authority. Sorry, can you repeat that? When you hollow all authority out, when you actually hollow all authority, when you don't have any other form of authority, what you get is bureaucratic authority. You do not get this equality. When you say there is no authority, you do not get equality. You yeah. get bureaucracy. That's the problem. When you're saying that between us, there is no authority. Yeah. You will not get equality. Yeah. That's a mistake. What you will get is bureaucracy and the worst form of bureaucracy possible. Yeah. And so that's I, the challenge. I, I, want to, I want to give a concrete example of this that also it kind of reflects Ebert's story, but it, it's exactly what you're saying, Chitan, with 
and that requires Marxist theory to come up with a theory of, of anxiety related to inequality is when I was in my, in my doctoral program, it was a weird program kind of on the outskirts of the institution. And we basically had our own little group that had uh, private funding. And the professor of the group wanted to create a appearance that we were an egalitarian tribe. So we're, we're all equal here. <laughs> and, and, and all throughout my doctoral program, I was hysterical uh, because I was saying, but we're not all equal here. You have 30 years more experience than us. You have a tenure pro professor position here. Uh, when you say something, everyone listens. When you publish a paper, thousands of other professors respond. And then we have a rank of postdocs and doctorals where everyone's had a different level and had a different experience level. And by not naming it, by pretending we're all the same, there was exactly what you say. There was a bureaucratic authority. So I, I think that, and at the same time, I think that the people and the lower ranks, they wanted it to be named. I, I want, I, I, I don't want a tyrannical professor, but I do want an authority because that's the, the that's what's going on here. That there's, there's someone who does have more experience and power and money and on so forth. If, if, if you define tyranny as misuse of one will over another, then bureaucracy is most tyrannical because it is ruled by nobody in some senses. It is, it is, it is nobody's will over you in that sense. That you do not even know whom to ask for. So the answer you get, this is bureaucracy. You cannot even go to somebody and say that uh, something wrong has happened because what you get is, oh, it's not my fault. Nobody this is our society to... today. <laughs> you know, that's this is our society, society today. Yeah, nobody's responsible. <laughs> no one's sense. responsible. There's no one to go to. Whenever there's something wrong, I had, there was a mistake with my, there was a mistake with my, my third COVID vaccination. Uh, they had made a mistake on the form and I was looking for someone who was responsible that I could get this form changed. Every time you go to a, a different bureaucracy, they'd send you to another bureaucracy. No one was responsible for the form. And I think this is where teacher-student relationship has to be taken very seriously because in the teacher-student relationship, some form of a different authority can emerge. If we have to think about this, this, this problem of Marxism seriously and we take, say, Richard Minard Keynes' theory and we move on to neoliberalism, you know, what you get is that Keynes was still trying to struggle with the non-relation. He was still trying to say that state is responsible for the economics in some senses. And then you get into a neoliberal system where you said that the state has to be devised upon the market conditions. That's what neoliberal turn actually was in some senses, that, that you have to let the non-relation be and actually enjoy the profit that comes out of it completely. You know, even that minimal... Uh, and problem with that, that structure in teacher-student relationship is that it immediately enters into very very tyrannical relationship of one form or the other, permissible or the strict kind. Both are actually failing in its, in its own contradiction because they both cannot actualize any authority between the teacher and the student. That, that authority cannot be actualized in the given conditions. That Which is why any good teacher that you see tries and finds a relationship outside the classroom with these students. All good teachers do that in one way or the other. Even if they have to be strict or permissive, whatever they have to be, they have to actualize that relationship uh, uh, parallel to the bureaucratic structure that that college gives them. And uh, in most institutions actually are aware of this today uh, because they know that teaching cannot happen purely through bureaucracy. Most good colleges at somewhere are reflecting upon this problem in one, one sense or the other. And I think the problem of authority has to be taken very seriously uh, and which is why the teacher-student relationship has to be taken uh, with, with a lot of... Uh, uh, importance because it is in the teacher-student relationship that that a different form of authority can manifest, which can then inform other form relationships in the society. In that sense, I think I think the problem of the authority, which is becoming an epidemic, it requires understanding absolute knowing. I think absolute knowing is the solution to the authority crisis. 
And based on that, you cannot just give laws arbitrarily and you cannot test laws for particular content. It requires the very form of the knower to be the ethical substance of the authority. So it requires absolute, it's a crisis of absolute knowing. It's a crisis of, it's a crisis of we're in a society with a lot of knowledge, but with no knowers. Uh, if I can push you back a minute uh, over here, uh, and I, I, I'm still skeptical about uh, authority and absolute knowing relationship, not because, you know, I, I don't agree with you. I, I completely agree with you. But because I think uh, yet we have to ask the question, where is the null authority of the absolute knower located? Now, where are you locating the authority within that structure? That still remains up for grabs in some senses. And 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 that problem and, and has to be recognized because that is the problem of power. That's a concrete problem of power. If we can't understand authority in that in the, in that manner, it immediately slips into different forms of power games. You know I think which is what Ebert was pointing out to us. Yeah, Ebert, please go ahead. No, I was just gonna say I think authority has been tied to duration um, and located within duration, uh, temporal within time. Uh, that's just my that's just my take right now, and, and and the reason why I'm saying that, I think that a lot of the rebellion against authority that we're talking about as an epidemic, is a rebellion against um, duration. Um, I think that the the immort the immortal teacher, the immortal authority, the re authority that refuses to die, refuses to be overcome. That of course rock and roll and. The Protestant, the, the rebellion against Protestantism, and of course, re Protestantism was also rebelling against. Um, but all of those repressive teacherly authorities that are refusing to die, in a in in the in the context of a capitalist society that uh, completely has disemboweled our relationship to death, um, has ended up tying authority uh, and respect uh, to duration. Um, my my experience of uh, of respect in society today at large, not my own personal experience, but my analysis of like Western respect of authority is those authorities which endure uh, hardship, whatever, those in and, and those which do not. And by the way, this is also my uh, experience of uh, Western analysis, and I think most analysis to relationship. If a relationship lasts, it was successful. If it didn't last, it didn't work out. And I think this idea of like um, success and duration needs to be uh, uh, untethered because otherwise we end up in a situation where those things which last are those things which deserve respect and those things which do not are those things which do not de deserve respect. And so of course the teacherly authority is going to be like, no, this institution, this way, this practice. And I think the general rebellion is against that sort of duration and hence and embodied in the trans movement, but in the broader sense of the word, which actually I back. So I think that if our teacherly authorities were more willing to be sublimated um, and had a, 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 a closer relationship to death and not so tied to duration, um, but to effect as opposed to duration, then we would be in a much different situation where authority was um, much more respected. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I just, I just, I just want to say because it's just so fresh in my mind that as it relates to the to the, to the law in 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 Hegel, the 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 proper place of the law has nothing to do with duration, but immediate being. And it's the immediate being of the form of the knower itself or the form of the self-consciousness. So I don't know how to solve the problem of, of how to think about that in institutional context. But it, to me, it points towards the, the, the immediate being of the form of the knower. And that has to be a being that has been, has been through death. Because basically, the self identity is dead. The only way, the only way that an, a being can be the immediate being of the form of the knower is if the self has died. So, could, uh, if I could just clarify, 
Um, are you saying that for the teachers, right, they need to be in control of the like ethical authority, but the the catch is they need to be the ones that also know how to die, like they have knowledge about how to die. Am I am I understanding that correctly? Yes. What I would say is, and like maybe in relationship to Ebert's emphasis on the institutions incorporating death, is that in order to have real teacherly authority, it's not just that you've learned a certain specific knowledge form. Like I, I studied physics or I studied behavioral science. It's that I'm the type of knower who has di- myself, I have died to myself. That is what gives me the capacity to be a, a teacherly authority. And it's I, my own ethical substance, my own being, not any of my particular knowledge. And that comes back to Zach uh, Stein's thing about um, true education being uh, that asymmetry, uh, the teacher who wants that asymmetry to close, who wants the te- which is essentially, in other words, wants themselves to die or become a vanishing mediator so that that asymmetry between teacher and student closes and that's the teaching process until the student overtakes or or makes the teacher relation student relationship zero or nothing and that's a death and if the teacher cannot jibe with their own death they can't teach in such a way that they try and get their student to close that asymmetrical gap completely agree um i'm i'm a little conservative in this personally now uh, and I don't know. I'll, I'll, Kettle, I'll slightly disagree with you in, 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 on this one. And let's see. Yeah. So uh, my own feeling on the problem of authority actually is that this question of the vanishing mediator in that sense, which is what I was trying to bring on before also in that sense, when I was saying that where, is, where, where do you want to locate that authority? Uh, my problem is that, that, that this problem is not a zero and one issue. And you know, uh, virtue, virtually, what what Kettle you are saying, say something like Zonser might agree with you that this problem of equality of intelligences, as he would call it, that it's not what you know makes a difference. Uh, in in, the, in that sense, uh, I actually agree with Hannah Arendt over there. I personally think that I agree. Finally, in an in an idealistic state, that is where you reach wish to achieve reach over there. But I don't think in practical context. Uh, authority immediately comes from there. What authority gets actualized is through very particular determined asymmetries in that moment. It, and that can be the asymmetry of knowledge also. It may not be. I'm not saying necessarily has to be so. But in certain contexts, or main, in many contexts around me, I see authority gets actualized. It gets individuated. It gets, you know, moving because of certain asymmetries that are determinately present over there. And that asymmetry can be an asymmetry of knowledge also. For instance, uh, uh, when I enter into certain relationships with my peers, uh, it's not necessary that my authority will be there if I can't uh, show them some asymmetry vis-a-vis them. It, it can be an asymmetry of money also in certain contexts. In other contexts, it can be asymmetry of certain other kinds of power. But in some context, it can be asymmetry of my knowledge vis-a-vis them, which actualizes it, and then I can play the role that you're asking me to play. In that. But I don't dis- I don't disagree with I don't disagree with that. What I, so what? How would you respond to what I'm specifically saying? Are the conditions of possibility for ethical authority? Like I'm not saying that authority doesn't emerge with asymmetries of knowledge, but I'm talking about the conditions of possibility for a let's let's say an ethical spiritual substance. There, I agree with you. That, okay, well, then, yeah, then we agree. And that is not where my disagreement lies. My only disagreement is that the conditions for the ethical substance doesn't exclude other asymmetries. That is where I, I, I'm, I'm little no, conscious of. No, definitely not. You know? I mean, yeah. uh, it's all it's all asymmetries yeah. of anything. It could be like yeah. bigger muscles. It, you know, it exactly. doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just trying to make that small point because I personally think Hannah Arendt is a very important thinker over there for this reason because she's able to articulate the very the very conditions for those asymmetries are important for this this ethical subject to emerge. Uh, without those asymmetries, that ethical subject will completely vanish in itself, and that that has to be uh, uh, you know uh, 
articulated and i think it's a difficult question to articulate i agree but that has to be said alongside this in that sense that it is due to some asymmetries that we can then articulate other kinds of uh, movements yeah uh, can i can i sort of respond to one thing that ebert was saying and i think that 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 response never went uh, complete uh, just to sort of get back to your, I think, even your, your very interesting provocation to us, where you were talking about a band in incidents. And I remembered a novel by, um, uh, you know, where this problem emerged, where they, they, they said that, that they never had to, they had a clan, and they had never had to name the leader of the clan. And incidentally, what happened at some point, people got up and said that, why is this person the leader? And it is at that moment that they had to name it. The problem was it was exactly that moment when they fell also. The clan itself, the conditions for the breaking of the clan also emerged. I'm not sure what happened in your case, but I suspect that the conditions for breaking of your group emerged at the point that you had to name yourself the leader. Um, so, that's a that's an interesting, yeah. I mean, essentially what, what, what happened to me, oh, oh, sorry, go go on, go on. You have yeah, more. please, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, what happened to me was I let it go, I let it go on unspoken too long and I became resentful. So, you know, and that's what happens whenever we let one of these pendulums go too far, we have to overcorrect, right? I mean, we don't have to, but we tend to. Um, and so I didn't, I didn't overcorrect, but in the context of the, the, the utopic, uh, paradigm I was trying to set up, it definitely probably felt like an overcorrection. Suddenly I was like, you know what? The songs that I write, if someone covers them, I'm going to get all the money. It was like, whoa. <laughs> like, but in any, you know, most, like a lot of bands, like if there's a front man, like, you know, everybody else splits 50% and the front man gets like, you know, full, or, 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 or everyone is just does on salary. So it's all contextual. But yeah, I mean, I think for me, it did precipitate a breaking, but that, that precipitation, there was a number of factors that led into that, but that was certainly one of them, um, being that um, there was a sort of dissolution from my own part where I was like, okay, this is, this is a band, we love each other, we've been together for like 10 years, we've become brothers and sisters, and um, at that point it was just uh, guys in the band. Um, but, this thing, this utopic equilibrium that was never actualized, that always just led as the, the, the erroneous foundation of our cohesion, um, that disintegration of that fantasy into the reality um, made it a lot less romantic. And I guess that's what I me meant when I brought up the romance, is there was something about naming it that I had to do that dis dissipated the romance, the unspokenness. You know, have you ever, I'm sure you guys have experienced this, you're, wit you're witnessing some amazing moment, you're in love or something in the sunset, and then you say, wow, this is great. And it's just like, <laughs> it just ruins it, right? Because like you, you named it. And, um, and there's something about not naming things. And, and I just wonder, I think that it's a fascinating, yes, there's the void of language and there's the thing and language is violence, but there's something about, there's something about our desire to live within the non-language of magic that facilitates so much of human interaction, but that interaction is not necessarily, I'm not convinced that that interaction is more honest or, or not, or, or not, um, under undergirded by a more honest re, uh, reality that could be accessed were we not so fucking egotistical that we had to not say everything. Yeah, we have to start naming. We have to move through the symbolic. Like, in, in the example you're giving, Ebert, I think Lacan's symbolic imaginary real functions perfectly here, where there's this relationship between the imaginary real, which is basically an, is basically a cover of the real which is the utopian equilibrium. Yeah. And then to get and then to move through, through that. the process of the naming, which is the function of the father, it's a paternal function and it's owning your phallus. Yeah, and to the point of of, you know, the repetition uh, negates the the succession. If we went through the language and we used it ad nauseum 
and we named everything, perhaps the language would disappear, but not as a reaction to language and as a fear of using language, but as a sublation of language so that we can transcend the language by naming, 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 right? And then suddenly move beyond it. Um, and that, that's my instinct of like where, because also I know that's my instinct because I'm afraid of doing that. Mm. So I, I know that there's something there. Uh, can I sort of complicate this a little? Because I, 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 I have my, my apprehensions here to some degree at least. <laughs> now, now, so in my case, what happens usually is that, that, you know, I have no anxiety with naming something in that sense, uh, as long as you know that naming. But there are contexts when I know if I have to name something, uh, it's better to move on. There is there's a context like that. When I have to enforce a name on a certain relationship, whether it's, 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 it's a love relationship or any other such form of relationship, you know, when I have to give it a name to get access to something which I won't get otherwise, you know, more often than not, I'm happy because uh, I know when I, I actually have to do that, uh, I'm crossing a certain boundary whose, whose context will, you know, uh, so I'm not so sure that this idea that if we name everything, we get something better out of things. Uh, uh, and that might that that might not be um, uh, the the result you 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 would you would get. On the flip side, the things that are necessary to be named, if they are not named, you would get only more disastrous results. Yeah. And there are things that are necessary to be named. There is no getting away from it. And and those names need to be enforced when they are not not get there in your in your social milieu. You know, it can be names or leadership. It can be male names or different kinds. But to put it on, on that spectrum where you say that everything needs to be named, uh, you might might not get the results that you, because they, they're the problem of violence of language will re-emerge. Uh, the problem in, say, Lacanian thing, the problem of non-all will re-emerge re -emerge in, in some senses. The problem of uh, thinking about a particular who doesn't have an exception. Chitin, yeah. my, quest, my question to you is, because I, I relate to the situation, I relate to both, so I relate to both, the necessity of naming in certain situations where if you don't name things is going to be a disaster. And I relate to the feeling of if I have to name something here, maybe it's better to move on. I, I relate to both. So in, in your own is, can you give examples or, 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 or how do you relate to the, to what situation is what, where you feel like naming is the correct thing to do in this situation, or I have to name here. Maybe it's best I move on. Okay, that's a very, um, very interesting. Uh, I'll, t I'll tell you what I can. I can give you an easy way to determine the difference. It's not. It's not that difficult. Uh, wherever naming enters into a contract, to entering, entering into a territory of violence. Wherever your name is succeeding a contract, you may still name it. That's, I'm not saying don't name it. I'm saying you should know that 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 non-contractual relationship is over at that moment. And there are certain names that are particularly meant for contractual relationships. Isn't it? And you should be very aware. You may do it for personal interests, and we all do it. But you should also know that 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 that, that existence of that non-contractual relationship at that moment is gone. Yeah. You know, on the flip side, uh, are there moments when you don't name something, you still enter you enter into a contract. And that's a big problem. You know. Yeah. Uh, for example, as Ebert, very nice <laughs> you know, and at the moments of and, and, and those moments are far more than this ones. To be honest, you need to name more than you maybe not need to, uh, you know, uh, in in many instances. And I'm not making that that claim, but uh, I'm just sort of varying that that simply naming things might not be a way out of this problem, out of the problem of authority, in in some senses. What I want to say is that what you're pointing towards there and thinking this, 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 this dimension, I think this is the zero level for problems of libidinal economy broadly. I agree. Yeah. That's, that's the issue. Yeah, I'm happy. Please go ahead. Uh, is, is there a third option though? Because I, I, I was thinking about Heidegger. There, I forget where I read it from exactly, but he talks about like, if you talk about it, it will turn the other way around. And 
and I'm and I, and I, and I want to make this distinguishment because I feel like it's important because it's like it's 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 in between not naming and naming. It's like talking about it, but I don't know how, I don't know what else to I don't know what to call that. It's you know do you know what I'm talking about, Jitan? Like it because it like if you talk about it, it it will turn around. And I feel like it's kind of like what we're doing right now. Because we haven't exactly named it. We we just called it student teacher relations. That's a very known name. So, but we haven't named it. Um, but I wonder if it's like the talking about it, that's what's gonna turn it around. Um, but I don't know. That, that that's just what I was thinking. I, I like the idea that if you don't name it, you're kind of in this magical space of relations which are non-contractual non-transactional uh, there's this magical sort of almost childlike space but naming it brings with it certain boundaries certain limitations um and then the question of whether to name it or not to name it is like, do you still want these relationships under the condition of the contract or are these relationships specifically special because of their non-contractual or non-transactional uh, nature? Uh, Kendall, I'll just sort of add quickly and then we can we go back to Javier in that, in, in that, into your question. Uh, look, I think the choice is not between not naming and naming. That's a false choice. Let's be honest about it. The choice is that can certain names themselves slip into contractual relationships? In that sense, they know, they're not even authentic names in some context. That instinct to name something in some context, the compulsion to name something, can take you away from its name itself. That's the, child, that's the problem. A lot of times when we, when we try and name everything, this compulsion to name can take you, take you away from its actual name. That's the problem. The problem is not not naming. No, not naming, I think, is a bad bad idea. Names are important. <laughs> Let's be honest about it. You know, the problem is that the, the, does the problem of naming get solved by naming everything? And that probably wouldn't because that might take you away from its actual name itself. And I'm using the word actual in quotations because I don't want to theorize too much. But uh, I think that, that, that should be thought about in, in a very nuanced manner. The lot of times naming something can itself take you away from its name. So to say, you know, and how do we think through that that kind of a problem? And that's a problem of sexuality. It's a little bit liberal economic question. In sexuality, also a similar problem emerges. You know, you uh, simple permissivity which is sexuality doesn't actually overcome the problem the resistance of sexuality itself. That that problem actually emerges. And somewhere naming everything is is, is that sexual, um, you know, uh, instinct where we think that you allow sexual right to run it through. And that will solve the problem. That might not solve the problem of sexuality in, in that sense. On um, Javier, yeah, please answer Kettle's question. I'm sorry, I took too long. Yeah. Oh no, I mean that that's all I was gonna say. I mean, I was, I was just saying like I I feel like I feel like you kind of addressed it, Chitan, where it was like like when Heidegger talks about like sometimes just talking about it, like when you're talking about something, it like it turns itself around. It's almost like you wanted it. You, it wants to be paid attention to, but you don't call it, you know, because, it, but it's just, you're paying attention to it, that it turns the other way around. That, that That's what I was trying to get at. And I feel like that's like the tricky part. And that's why, like you said, like the, the not naming and the naming, that's kind of like, it doesn't capture the movement of the actual thing. See, uh, Javier, I, I would not, uh, you know, uh, uh, I would not try and sort of think that I know Heidegger and something. I think what you're raising is a much more, much more uh, important question than we are discussing somewhat. That's the question of the outside, outside of language in that sense. How do we, how do we, and that's what I think some kind of a problem was that, that, and, and you're right, in, in that sense, that, that naming something actually assumes it to be inside. You know, you, you naming something, as you said, has a violence because you assume that it is already a part of what you know. You already put it into a certain network of signifiers, as as Lacan would put it in that sense. And, and, and Heidegger's problem actually always remains that how do you find this authentic relationship with the outside? 
I'm not sure I would agree with Heidegger's solution to that problem. And that's a more complicated question to think about that. That uh, can that problem be solved outside language? Uh, uh, Kettle would be a good person to, uh, you know, uh, sort of bring Lacan here. And when he says the imaginary symbolic discussion, to, uh, and how do we bring Lacan and Heidegger into a conversation over there is much more, I think, a tricky business to think about. Uh, on, on, that, on, that point, I, I, on that point, I'll just say that where Heidegger says language is the house of being, Lacan says language is the, the torture house of being. <laughs> Which is, but I, I also I also want to be mindful of the time, and I know Ebert actually has to leave soon. So I was thinking that maybe we can give some short reflections on the the, the the you know the basic the basic theme of this talk here: teacher idols and masters, um, and maybe specifically like a little summary of of how we're how we're. Um, feeling about this conversation and maybe some some takeaway point that you might want to leave uh, viewers or, or listeners with. Um, any, anyone who wants to to pick up on that, Ebert, if you if you wanna if you wanna start, I know you got a time sure. To yeah. Um, it's interesting. I'm. Uh, Part of the asymmetry uh, is this, and it's something that I study a lot with my, my work on cool, as just this aura. And it's hard to classify what the aura is, but something about someone else um, that uh, creates an asymmetry. Um, and usually that asymmetry, the, the larger that asymmetry, the more sort of fertile that gap um, the more reverence I tend to have. Um, you know, there's a good Seinfeld episode, I think I've brought this up before with you, Cadell, uh, where, uh, sorry, it's not Seinfeld, it's Curb Your Enthusiasm, where Larry David is supposed to go meet a survivor. And he's Jewish, and so of course we all think that it's a survivor of the Holocaust. And everyone gets ready, and they're prepared, and they go to meet this survivor, and it turns out to just be a television show uh, guest on a show called Survivor. And um, he's like 24 years old, this guy, right? And so everyone, and Larry David's like, that's the survivor. <laughs> and everyone's upset. No longer does everyone have reverence for this guy, right? Because the gap, the asymmetry, what this guy has survived is not that grand. But the kicker in this episode is that an actual survivor of the Holocaust is at this party because he thinks he's gonna meet another survivor there and they can link up. So when he meets the survivor, they start having a competition about who survived more. And the survivor's like, well, I went through the Holocaust. The other guy's like, yeah, but I was naked for like three days and I had no food on the island. And they start going, and the reverence competition and the, ace, the, ace, the competition of asymmetry was all about how much someone had survived, how much someone had struggled. Because the more they had struggled, the deeper the comparison, the deeper the chasm was with everyone else in the room. And I'm about to get off this and go on a call uh, with um, these First Nation chiefs uh, up in BC, Canada, because we're doing this action for a bank that is trying to drill a pipeline through their territory. And when I get on the call with these guys, and this is the, the Chief Namox, and I, he's, got, he's got everything that you want in a chief, right? From like a white man's perspective. He's like, he's got the, these amazing phrases and this cadence and all of that, but what really separates me from him and creates the sort of teacher dynamic for me is the unknown. What has, his, what has his blood, what has he gone through that I could not possibly comprehend? What has been transferred down through the generations into him that I cannot possibly comprehend? All of these uh, struggles and things that he's survived and, um, and then I get back to again duration. Um, and uh, an effect, and um, and I guess I guess I'll just leave it with that: is that there's there's something there's there's I, I basically I found this 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 conversation to be extremely wide ranging, extremely rich. Um, I could say so much um, that my mind is sort of shattering at the moment. But um, yeah, there's just I just enjoyed the conversation. I have to wrap this up so my mind's a little scattered, but um, I could do this again. I feel like there's 8.0s of this. It's a very rich uh, 
conversation. So thank you guys. And I'm, I'm going to have to scoot off to grab on this call, but um, thank you so much for hanging out. And cheers. Thank you, Robert. Thank All you. Right. <laughs>
uh, someone can have an authority over me, that I, I, it's not simply that I want to break out of a cage for no cage, it's that I want to break out of a cage for a better cage or a, a cage where I see my conditions of possibility to really flourish. And I think what's interesting is to think about these dynamics as a radical individuated self-search as opposed to an institutional imposition. Um, I know that in many ways that has been how I've mediated a lot of my intellectual development and and maybe there's I, I don't know I don't know if there's an end to that process in myself because I, I, I think there's a maturation of that process in myself. That's what I that's what, anyway what I see in myself. Um, but certainly I think what's at stake here and what came up in our conversation that I think is important that I want to leave people with, at least from my point of view, is this difference between a fantasy of horizontal egalitarianism versus the real of asymmetrical relationships, which are necessary to mediate a sort of overcoming and desire. So, so maybe that's that's where I'll, I'll leave my final thoughts. So, th thank you both, Javier and and Chitan, and for um, for everyone who's uh, been watching for the last two hours and twenty minutes. And uh, I'll see you when I see you.